Good afternoon. Welcome to today's PASA webinar, Survey Research Methods, Collecting and Processing Data. Survey Research Methods is the third installment of a three-part webinar series, Statistical Tools for Attorneys in Litigation. Part 1, Introduction to Data, and Part 2, The Basic Tools, were presented in the spring of 2012. Part 3, Survey Research Methods, is composed of four phases, planning and designing a survey, developing survey instruments, collecting and processing data, and interpreting and reporting results. During this program, collecting and processing data, the presenter will cover the following, mail data collection, gathering interview data, and processing the data. The presenter for today's program is Dr. Jack Ravel. Dr. Ravel is a consulting statistician with a PhD in, in industrial engineering and management from Oklahoma State University. Dr. Ravel provides his technical assistance in both quality and industrial engineering to attorneys involved in litigation. We'll take two question and answer breaks during today's program. If you have a question, we ask that you use the chat or Q&A features found on the right-hand side of the screen to submit your questions. We encourage all attendees to submit questions throughout the presentation. Tomorrow morning, I will send out an email with a link to the archived recording of this program, as well as a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. We do ask that you take time that will fill out the, to fill out the survey that will appear on your screen after today's program is over. I now invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy. I'm going to turn the presentation over to our distinguished guest, Dr. Jack Ravel. Jack, the program is all yours. I thank you very much, Matt, and hello, everybody. Uh, Matt, tell me uh, what slides you've got up on the screen, would you please? Uh, sure, the title slides, Statistical Tools for Attorneys in Litigation, uh, with your name at the bottom of it. Okay. Uh, let's, let's move from that uh, to uh, the next slide. If, uh, if anybody wants any information about me, it's on this multicolor slide with the, the dice up in the top right. And uh, that's, if, if anybody needs any uh, further information on, on uh, the material that I'm going to be covering uh, during this webcast, uh, use the phone number uh, listed in, on the right side in the middle of the slide. And uh, one of uh, Tasha's uh, specialists will, uh, will get you an attorney, or not an attorney, a, uh, a statistician that can help you with your, uh, your situation. As, as Matt just said, this is uh, the third part of a three-part series. We've already done parts one and two. We're right now right in the middle of part three on uh, survey research methods. Going to the next slide, uh, we're going to talk today about uh, part three. And just as a way of background, as Matt's already mentioned, uh, this is a four-part series. In phase one, planning and designing a survey, uh, we talked about three, we had three sections, initiating a survey, planning a project, and designing a sample. I'm mentioning these now because these are uh, recorded and are available to uh, those of you who would like to see it again or who have not seen it at all. Uh, phase two, we talked about last time. This is the one in red, uh, developing survey instruments. In this, uh, in this phase, we talked about composing a question, creating, creating item scales, and constructing questionnaires. Today, We'll be talking about uh, collecting and processing data. This is on slide number six. Uh, section seven will be uh, mail data collection, eight gathering interview data, and nine processing the data. Ne next time, two weeks from today, on uh, Tuesday, the fourth of December, uh, we'll go into the fourth and final phase of this of this series, interpreting and reporting results. And I would encourage you uh, to uh, participate. Uh, we'll be talking in Section 10 on analyzing the results, interpreting statistics, and finally, reporting the information. And with this background, let's move on to the next slide as we begin Phase 3, Collecting and Processing Data. Now we're starting on Section 7. And in Section 7, uh, the first item, male survey characteristics are a thing that we need to be concerned about. Uh, that is on the part of the recipient of the survey, uh, the perceived length of the survey, the ordering of the questions, the orientation of an appeal that's made in the cover letter, the appeal uh, to uh, complete the uh, survey or questionnaire, 
and finally, the, an inclusion of promises to share results with the respondents. I found uh, in the many years of doing survey work that when uh, the respondents to a survey uh, know that they will get the results, uh, they're much more likely to uh, participate in the, in the survey. We also need to be concerned about the very high correlation between the perceived rate, perceived rate of response and, one, the length of the survey, two, the size of the paper, and three, the order of the questions. These are things that we need to be concerned about, we being uh, you, the attorney, and, uh, and I, or any other statistician who would be assisting you in the, the, the development and analysis of the results of your survey. Moving on to the next slide, data, Mail Data Collection 2, we talk about the mailing piece production. This is when you're doing a, a mail piece, uh, snail mail, that is, uh, this paper stock, uh, the finish of the paper, its color and size. These are all matters of consideration. And in a much longer uh, webcast or seminar, uh, we would be discussing each of those in detail. We also need to be uh, concerned with print characteristics, that is the color, the typeface, and type size. There are known uh, colors, known typefaces, and type sizes that turn on and turn off potential respondents to a survey. The page layout, that is the format and appearance. And finally, talking about mailing piece production, assembling the piece, that is the attachments and enclosures that go with the questionnaire. Moving on to number 10, we also have to be concerned with vendors and services. Uh, where are you going to get your name list? That is the sources of your name list. Uh, working with the United States Postal Service, or snail mail that is, stationers and paper suppliers, uh, desktop publishers, those can be selected from Google, as can printing companies. Then you also have mailing houses uh, when you're going to be dealing with email. Firms like, and I am not recommending, I'm just mentioning them, uh, Constant Contact and SurveyMonkey. These are both available uh, just uh, typing into Google and you can get uh, the addresses for those. On the next slide, number 11, uh, what are the, comp the mailing piece components for snail mail? You have the mailing envelope, the address that the uh, envelope is being sent to, the return address that you want to use, where do you want the uh, response uh, mailed back to, and postage. These are all cons uh, considerations when you're dealing with a mailing piece. And with the cover letter, again, this applies both to snail mail and email. Uh, bulk printed cover letters versus personalized cover letters. You know, these are decisions that are made after some discussion uh, between the participants that are pre uh, preparing uh, the survey. Now on slide 12, we're going to be talking about the questionnaire itself. Uh, there's a checklist of requested tasks and a, re a return envelope for snail mail. Of course, with uh, email, uh, we would just uh, have a uh, return. Inducements to respond. Selecting inducements is a very important consideration. We have to talk about things like the economy, non-reactivity, uniqueness, of value, luxuriousness, and individualization. Finally, uh, the types of inducements that might be offered, cash payments, certificates or passes, drawings, sweepstakes, reports of results, these are all things that need to be considered uh, before you uh, prepare all the information and get it typed up and published and, and uh, collated and moved, and moved into envelopes and uh, the envelope being uh, per, uh, appropriately processed and then finally uh, mailed out to the intended uh, recipients. Moving on to slide 13, still talking about mail data collection. This is our sixth slide on that topic. Uh, in terms of mailing and receipt, we have to be sure uh, that we have our, our timing uh, set up so that the responses will come back in a, in a, by the cutoff date and the recording of non-deliverables and response rate computation and remailing and redropping, site editing. And then we also have to concern ourselves with self-administered 
surveys. Going back for a second to uh, response rate co computation, uh, I know that none of you are uh, uh, thinking that every single uh, item that's sent out, whether it's by uh, snail mail or email, will be respond responded to. If it's a, something that hits a, a hot button for the res potential respondents, you can expect a higher response rate. Uh, if it's not, a much lower response rate. And these, uh, the response rate is also influenced by the perceived length of the survey uh, and the other things that I mentioned uh, just a few slides back. So if you need, I'll give you, give you an example, uh, 100 completed responses, you may have to send out uh, 1,000 in order to get uh, 100 back. Or you may only need to send out 500 depending upon whether or not you've hit a hot button. Moving on, we're ready to summarize uh, this section seven on mail data collection. And the things that we're gonna talk about, as you can see on, on slide number 14, it's very uh, straightforward. First, coordinate the production. Make the decisions about any one component in the light of their effect on the others, the interactions, if you will, and on the mailing piece as a whole. Second, make the production consistent. Select the paper, the print, page layout, and assembly that are consistent among the components of the mailing piece. Did you ever, for example, did you ever look at an ad in a newspaper or a magazine and see a half a dozen or more different type styles? Very, very disconcerting. You wanna be consistent in the appearance uh, of, of the mail piece, of the cover letter, of the envelope, colors, prints, uh, print sizes, uh, uh, font style are all uh, important to be consistent. Next, use of external services. Contact name list sources, the post office, stationers, word processing shops, graphic artists, printers, and mailing houses. Next, evaluate your vendors carefully. Obtain referrals or samples of work or products and compare the cost and time requirements among several outside sources, just as if you were gonna hire a plumber or an electrician in your home. Next, use appropriate envelopes. Now I'm talking, of course, of snail mail only. Uh, follow the principles and recommendations for addressing return address and selection and affixing of postage. Next, create an effective cover letter. Use an example and be sure that all the questions recipients might ask are clearly answered in the letter. You don't wanna lose potential respondents just because they don't understand what it is that you want and they become frustrated and just throw it away. Next, select an effective inducement. Examine many alternatives and evaluate them using the major criteria for selection. We spoke of those major uh, inducements, uh, the criteria uh, on slide number 12, uh, the title of which was uh, seven mail data collection, uh, slide five. And finally, here on uh, slide 14, let's practice timing and follow up. Select an appropriate mailing date, allow sufficient time for response, and monitor returns as recommended. That completes our discussion of Section 7. If you have any questions or comments or thoughts uh, on this subject, I would, I would urge you to uh, contact Matt and let him know, and he can provide me with, with the questions, which I'll, I'll attempt to uh, provide a satisfactory uh, response to you. Uh, and remember, if one person has a question, probably a number of others have exactly the same question. Hey, Jack, uh, talking about um, in inducements and um, incentives for um, uh, participants uh, or people to participate in the survey, uh -huh. is it your opinion and, and, and have you found that, um, that uh, such incentives have to be um, put forward for surveys that will be used in litigation? litigation? And what, what is the difference in response rate between the surveys that don't have incentives versus the surveys that do provide in incentives? Well, let me answer the second one first, 
And the, the very fact that the inducements are used is because over a period of many, many years, uh, they've found that the right inducements can, in fact, uh, help to increase the response rate. Now, going to the first question, uh, is there a need for inducements when, when it, we're involved in some kind of litigatory, if there is such a word, uh, litig litigatory activities? Uh, it, re it depends who your target audience is. If, if you're going to the general public, it could be of great value. If you're going to associates of an employee who was let go and the employee uh, feels that it was, he, was, he or she was let go for inappropriate or unreasonable reasons and you want to find out what the uh, fellow employees think of the, the particular individual who, is, uh, who we are focusing on, then the odds are inducements are not necessary. But as to whether or not inducement should be used or not used really depends on the circumstances uh, as to uh, the uh, target audience, uh, as to uh, the rate at which you would like to see the uh, surveys or questionnaires responded to. For example, if you say, uh, if you got an answer back to us within seven days, or talking snail mail, or let's say within uh, one or two days by email, then an inducement uh, would be very valuable, whether you're uh, dealing with uh, litigation or not. But if time is not of the essence, uh, an inducement to uh, speed up the response probably would do very little good. So I, I think the, the final uh, comment I would make on this subject would be that uh, the attorney uh, who are uh, employing the use of a, of a statistician would want to have a discussion with the statistician as to what their objectives are, uh, what, what needs to be accomplished so that they can jointly decide whether or not an inducement is appropriate. And Jack, uh, in your many years of uh, doing this, have you ever seen an inducement brought up in a trial saying, or trying to invalidate the survey by saying, well, the only reason the, you know, the participants answered the survey is because they, they were going to get, they had a chance to get X, Y, or Z? No, and I'll tell you why. Because normally the inducements are a very nominal kind of uh, uh, item. You know, it's, it's not like you're offering everybody a uh, hundred dollars or you know something and go out and uh, have a, a very nice dinner uh, you're talking about something very simple like a uh, a gift card for ten dollars or something and so uh, unless the uh, inducement is something of substantial value that would really turn heads or it's something that would make a headline in a, in a newspaper uh, I I really doubt that it would be brought up and in, in my experience it never has been Okay, great. I don't see any other questions in the queue, so why don't we continue on with the presentation? All righty. And uh, by the way, I, for those of you who don't know, I'm in Southern California, about uh, a 15-minute drive from Disneyland, and it is an absolutely gorgeous day. This is the kind of weather that brings people out to California, uh, and that's why days like this on uh, uh, when the Rose Bowl is played is how uh, the uh, – population of California seems to grow, despite what you may think about our taxes and our earthquakes. I've lived out here since 77, and I love it. You couldn't get me to move. That's got nothing to do with the presentation, but I thought I'd get that off my chest. Just like in class when you've got a, a professor that goes off on a tangent. Now, on slide number 15, entitled Gathering Interview Data, number one, we have to consider if this is now not a, a snail mail or an email kind of, of uh, survey. This is a face-to-face -face or uh, telephone interview. And so we want to talk about things like the role of the interviewer. Uh, what mode of interviewing will they use? As I mentioned, is it going to be face-to-face? -face? Uh, is it going to be uh, uh, by telephone? Uh, is it going to be uh, with several people all at once, like a focus group? Uh, second, uh, what is the agency capability and limitations, the agency being the agency that you use uh, to go out and, and do the interviewing? Uh, they may have people who are experienced, trained, uh, capable uh, interviewers, and you provide them with the questions, and they are able to uh, uh, provide the questions to the, uh, to the respondents in a uniform way so that whether you've got interviewer one, interviewer two, or interviewer, interviewer 20, 
they're all asking the same questions in the same way, and you're able to uh, eliminate any uh, inter uh, interviewer bias. And finally, uh, depending on your uh, situation, you may be using in-house interviewers, and you know, cer we certainly don't want to uh, ignore that potential. Moving on to slide number 16, there are data collection agencies, and uh, these agencies uh, have a data collection process, if you will, step one leading to step two leading to step three, and the, the six steps that uh, just everyone goes through, uh, because they're all vital, is the uh, initial contact by the attorney or the attorney's staff with the agency uh, to obtain a cost estimation, and I'll add, as well as a time estimation uh, to conduct the survey or questionnaire. Second, uh, we need to be uh, we need to consider about the selection notification and alerting of the agency uh, as to when to get started. Uh, third, delivery of materials and acknowledgement of receipt. Uh, fourth, training instruction and initiation within the agency or in house uh, to the uh, interviewers. Then, monitoring, control, and supervision of the interviewers. And finally, the receipt veri verification. Uh, of the uh, uh, information coming back to the data collection agency. We move on to 17 on the same subject. Uh, we're here now. We're talking about the interviewers uh, who are supervised. Uh, there are there are some management functions we need to consider. Recruitment of the interviewers if none are available and you want to bring them in house on a temporary basis. The selection of those interviewers. The training of the interviewers. Supervising the the training. And then finally, compensation to be provided to the interviewers. These are all things that you know you just don't normally think about, but, but must be done. On slide number 18, gathering interview data, number four, there's lots of room for error. And these take place during the interview, interviewing error, if you will. And the different types of error that we need to be aware of so that we can do something about it, uh, that is to minimize it. You'll never eliminate all of it uh, because we're all human beings. Uh, things like instruction error, interrogation error, response option error, scale interpretation error, recording error, response interpretation error, and finally, controlling interviewer error. So as you can see, there's a lot of room for error. And moving on to slide number 19, there's also uh, a thing called bias, uh, interviewing bias. In this case, uh, the creation of a response bias that's caused by a biased interviewer who may put emphasis on certain words or uh, his or her choice of words in asking the questions. Even though they've been trained uh, on how to ask the questions, uh, they may deviate. Uh, and finally, amplification of response bias. These are all things we need to concern ourselves with. And then finally, uh, we've got over to, uh, I say finally, uh, we'll move to the next, uh, the next uh, slide, number uh, 20. And here we're talking about the interview questionnaire. Uh, we want to be concerned with the greeting that will be used by the interviewer in talking to others potential respondent. And that, uh, that of course, covers whether we're dealing with a, uh, a telephone interview or a face-to-face -face interview. And then we want to talk about the interviewee qualification criteria. Does this person that you're talking to meet the criteria? Uh, that is, uh, have you already talked to too many people that are male or too many that are female or too many that are young or too many that are old? So you have to, we have to be concerned with qualification criteria. And uh, well, that means that we have to have some quota specifications, and we'll talk about that on the next slide. But let's finish this last one here on this page, and that is uh, the interview questionnaire format in terms of how the uh, question the questions are ordered, in terms of the the simpler uh, questions first and the more complex ones later on as you go through uh, moving towards the end. But in looking at the the next uh, slide, slide number 21. Here's a typical quota specification sheet. Uh, let's say that there are three variables. They are marital status.
status, gender or sex, and three, age. Now, the groups that go with each of those three variables, as you can see, uh, for marital, married or not married, uh, sex, men or women, age, 20 to 34, 35 to 49, and 50 to 99. Now, what do we, what do we know about this? Well, first of all, it says we're not interested in anybody who's 19 years of age or less. And uh, we're assuming that we're rarely, if ever, going to run into somebody who is one, age 100 or more. Although we know they exist, uh, the odds are that we're not going to be uh, talking to them. Uh, and I want you to notice in this, uh, the way the, the groups are organized, if a person is age 34, he's in group, he or she is in group one. If they're 35, he or she is in group two. You've got to separate these things. So I see a tendency, a lot of people who don't think about the numbers, that they might say 20 to 35, 35 to 50, 50 uh, to 99 or 100. And what that means is that when somebody, the, when an interviewer is collecting information, a demographic information, uh, if somebody says uh, he's 35 or she's 35, then you don't know which of the, the three groups to put them in. So you have to be very cautious in terms of the, uh, the way the uh, uh, groups are organized. And over on the far right-hand side, you see the number of people that we're going to be talking to. So you know that N, our sample size, is going to be 240 because the sum of all the uh, marital uh, respondents is 240, the sum of all the uh, gender uh, groups is 240, and the sum of the three age groups is 240. Now, we can uh, set that up with interdependent quotas. That down at the, the, bottom of, the bottom half of the page, we now have uh, marital uh, on, the, on the far left, where we have married versus non-married. We have six groups of married and six groups of not married. And within the, the married group, we've got three groups of men and three groups of women, and the same for the not married. And then over in the next to the uh, right column, we have our, our three age groups uh, for men, the three age groups for women. And when we get into not married, we have the same three age groups for men and the same three uh, age groups for not married women. And if you sum all of those, those 12 uh, different uh, categories, you notice that each one is, has been identified a quota of 20. And of course, 20 times 12 is 240. And that's the same numbers that you saw at the top of the page. Now, this is a quota specification sheet. This is the kind of thing that the uh, attorney and the, and the statistician he or she is working with uh, can, can make decisions on. And how did that 240 get uh, selected? Well, that's based on the size of the population, the target population, and what kind of response rate is being anticipated. And uh, these are the kinds of things that the attorney needs to rely on the advice of an experienced professional uh, consulting statistician to make sure that the, the right number of people in the right categories uh, are interviewed so as to provide the uh, information that will be trusted and believable uh, in uh, a court uh, environment. Now, let's move on to slide number 22. And in slide number 22, uh, we talk about the personal interviewing process. And we're interested in how long it's going to take, where we're going to do the interview, what distractions and interruptions may exist, will it be necessary to use rating cards with visual aids, and finally, the recording of observations and responses. Some of this applies to, well, all of it applies to face-to-face -face interviews, and some of them to telephone interviews. Moving on to uh, slide number 23, uh, gathering interview data number eight, the telephone interview process, which we've not spent a lot of time on, uh, is uh, we need to be concerned about the calling location. Is it going to be a boiler room environment where you've got you know, uh, half a dozen or a dozen or more uh, men and women in a, a single room separated into little cubbies so that they can be uh, dialing uh, to, uh, to call the potential respondents. Uh, you're also going to have to make sure that each, each of the uh, callers, the interviewers, uh, have a name list or directory. And you want to make sure that they know uh, 
how long the telephone interview should last. And then, of course, you're finally interested in the call results and the options that are available uh, in, in uh, the uh, actual uh, phone discussion. This takes us to the final slide on Section 8, Gathering Interview Data. Uh, and these are, this is the topic summary. First, understand the interviewer's role. The telephone interviewers or field workers should be perceived as part of the measurement instrument with potential to create error and bias, as I mentioned earlier. Second, consider the data collection agency. Study the agent data collection process and check on agency cost, availability, and quality carefully. Third, appreciate the interviewer management task. Study the interviewer management functions and weigh the advantages and disadvantages of using an in-house crew. Of course, in most cases for that in-house crew, uh, crew, you're going to have to do some uh, temporary hiring. Next, choose the mode of interviewing. Evaluate the capabilities and limitations of data collection agencies compared to an in-house interviewing crew. Fifth, reduce potential interviewing error. Consider instruction, interrogation, response, scaling, recording, and interpretation as possible sources of error. Sixth, control interviewing and response bias. Check each element of the questionnaire and process for each of the major sources of bias that we spoke of earlier. Next to last, handle instrumentation carefully. Compose the greeting, qualification, and quota criteria, interviewer instructions, and questionnaire format to help avoid error and bias. And finally, uh, in this topic summary on Section 8, identify the unique aspects of each process. That is, recognize the distinctions between personal and telephone interviewing, making required adjustments for whatever mode is selected. Okay. That completes our discussion of Section 8. Uh, and Matt, is there, do you think uh, we have any questions on that, on that particular subject? Uh, we do have a couple questions. And I would encourage all the attendees uh, to continue to submit their questions. Uh, and we'll answer them in the order in which they come. Um, Jack, uh, talking about. Uh, reducing potential interviewing error. Um, do you have any strategies that you can share with the attendees on how to mitigate errors in this phase of uh, data collection? Yes, I, I sure do. Uh, one of the first things you want to do is have a complete set of instructions for the interviewers that, you're, that will be shared with them at the time they go through training. And if they, were, if they are people who do interviewing all the time, you want to make sure that whatever agency you're working with, that you are satisfied with the training that has been provided to the interviewers previously. And you may want to augment those instructions with something that is specific to your particular situation, you being the attorney. And then I would, I would actually sit in uh, or have your statistician sit in uh, to, to review what's going on, listen to it, and bring back information to you to comment on the, on the quality of the training that is being provided to the uh, uh, people who are going to be doing the interviews. And then, of course, there should be some kind of test at, at the conclusion, or perhaps several tests uh, during the training to assure that the, the interviewers really understand what, uh, what's going on. You can't just sit there for you know, four hours or six hours or eight hours getting instruction. And uh, for all you know, there's, uh, you know the, eye, the eyes are open, but the mind is closed. And they have no idea what you know what's expected of them. So one of the things you want to do, in addition to providing the training, is get feedback in the form of some kind of uh, either oral or written testing uh, from the interviewers before the, they're, they are permitted uh, to go out and start doing the interviews, either by telephone or by face-to-face. Uh, -face. That should help to uh, to minimize the potential uh, error and bias. Uh, that could go on during the, uh, the interview process. Okay, great. Um, I don't see any other questions in the queue, so why don't we continue on with the presentation? Sounds good to me. Uh, we're ready to go on to slide number 25, uh, which is entitled 9, Processing the Data. First slide. 
First, we're going to be talking about the receipt of the questionnaires. They're coming back now. Uh, you're going to have uh, a lot of data coming back, and you have, we need to be concerned with how the completed questionnaires are being handled. And there's going to be some site edi editing of the documents to determine whether or not they are complete, uh, whether or not uh, all the, the uh, questionnaires uh, have, uh, that have multiple questions on them uh, have, have been completed, and finally check for any editing, branching, and exclusions uh, that are unique to the particular interview process uh, that uh, is, has just been achieved. On slide 26, uh, we're talking about the uh, second slide in processing the data. We want to talk about post-coding the data, uh, which means the criteria for post-coding. By post-coding, of course, we mean coding the, uh, the data uh, after it has been collected so that we can put it uh, to the best use. And maintaining a code book so that whoever is doing that post-coding, uh, if there's multiple people doing it, they're all using the same code book and the same codes. It's like if you go to your CPA and the CPA is looking at uh, your various uh, expenses for your business, uh, you want to make sure uh, that every time there's a, an entry on a particular item that it's being coded with the same number, uh, not several different numbers, depending on the judgment of the person who's doing the coding. So uh, we need to have that post-coding properly uh, controlled by using, the, uh, by using a, uh, uh, an up-to-date code book. Then we move on to data processing. And the whole purpose of data processing is to crunch the numbers. And I don't think I need to say too much about crunching the numbers. We want to find out how many of, of a particular type of response uh, we got, and uh, by way of demographics, who is giving those responses? Are they the, primarily from men, primarily from women, primarily from uh, one age category, primarily from one marital care category? And by the way, I'm using those, those numbers, those categories, strictly as example. Uh, it may well be that you really don't care about men versus women. It may be uh, between professionals and non-professionals between people who have an undergraduate degree and those who have a, a graduate degree or those who have not finished high school. All kinds of different categories. And we, it, it, a good statistician can very easily help you to break those up into categories so you can classify them properly. And finally, we want to talk about scale and data types. There's four of them. Nominal scale data, ordinal scale data, interval scale data, and ratio scale data. Now on slide 27, we begin to talk about these uh, in detail. For example, on slide number 27, we talk about nominal scale data, which organizes data by name. These numbers are assigned to these data uh, are arbitrary. An example, uh, gender, with the choices labeled either male or female. That's nominal data. That's name, nominal and name. That's a good way to remember it. Ordinal data has all of the qualities of nominal data, but also indicates direction. For example, uh, psychological scales uh, often use ordinal data uh, scales such as indications of preference, low, medium, or high. It just occurs to me, you probably wouldn't want to talk about low, medium, and high with regard to male or female. That gets too complicated. Now, number 20, slide number 28, uh, we want to see if we can uh, understand the differences and similarities between nominal and ordinal. Classifying someone as either extroverted or introverted is an example of using a nominal scale. Setting up a similar scale, such as one for shy, two for neither shy nor outgoing, and three for outgoing, is an example of using an ordinal level of measurement. Hopefully that helps to uh, explain the uh, relationship or the differences and the similarities between nominal and ordinal uh, scales. Moving on to slide number 29, now let's talk about interval scale data. This is the third one. This has all the qualities of ordinal data, except that the distance between all scale items is the same. That is, it has equal intervals. For an example, 
uh, with temperature. The measurement difference between any two degrees is the same as the difference between any two other degrees. Like the, the distance between uh, 70 and 71 degrees is the same as the, the distance between uh, 91 and 92 degrees. That's interval scale data. And finally, we have on slide 30, ratio scale data, which is the most complex of the, these four levels of measurement. Ratio scales own all of the qualities of nominal, ordinal, and interval data. But in addition, they also have an absolute zero. For example, age, time, number of children, and grade point average. If you'd like to see what it looks like graphically, we'll go to slide 31. Starting from the far left, we have our nominal scale data. In the second column from the left, ordinal data. Second from the right, interval data. Remember, now it has a zero base. And at the far right, ratio data, where the uh, distances are exactly the same, but and with a zero. Hopefully that helps to explain these scale data types. Now you say, you might say, well, that's very interesting, but why, why are you talking about that? Because when you're developing the questionnaire, uh, you're going to have different responses, and you need to know how to code the responses, whether you're using, uh, and you have to decide in advance whether you're using nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio data, so as to maximize the value of the interpretation of the responses, the uh, analysis of the responses uh, that you've got, so when it's presented in court, that the, there is a clear indication of what actually has transpired as a result of the uh, survey or questionnaire that was administered, whether it's done by phone, whether it's done face-to-face, -face, whether it's done uh, in a uh, by snail mail or email. You've got responses coming back, and you want to classify them in, the, in a way that will make the most uh, take the greatest advantage, if you will, of, of what you've got back to, to clarify the issues uh, at hand. Now, that's enough, I think, on, on scale data types. Uh, let's move on to slide number 32. And in slide 32, we're talking about uh, the processing of the data. This, this is the third uh, slide for that. And we're talking about recoding the data. Sometimes we recode it to get fewer values because it's easier to understand. And then we want to recode it to meaningful categories. Maybe it turns out that uh, uh, having uh, age from 20 to uh, 34 and 35 to uh, 49 uh, is not, uh, doesn't make as much sense as merging them. And so you have a category that goes from uh, 24 to uh, 49. Now, you can always merge data, but once you've collected the data, there's no way to separate it. Which brings to mind the, the, the uh, point that I'd like to make, and that is sometimes it's better to uh, have more complex categories to start out with, and you can compress them or recode them into meaningful categories after you get the answers back. Uh, I've seen data that you can picture in your mind's eye, if you will, a normal distribution, and you can change the shape of the normal distribution very, very easily simply by changing the, uh, the categories, whether it's from... Uh, uh, 1 to uh, 5 and 6 to 10, and, or, and that's in groups of 5. Maybe you're going to change it to, uh, from 1 to 3, uh, 4 to 7, uh, 8 to uh, 11, et cetera, with, with intervals of, of 3. It's important to have meaningful categories, and it's, it's also an advantage to understanding to have fewer, fewer categories. Uh, those are the kinds of things that need to be discussed between the attorney and the statistician at the outset as you're designing the, uh, the response chart. Well, remember when we talked earlier uh, in this presentation of, about the uh, uh, quota specification sheet on slide 21. And we're also going to talk about recording and category N size, N being the sample size. We'll talk about subsample selection and report labeling, all as we're getting ready uh, to provide 
um, a comprehensive and understandable report that will go to uh, for a presentation during the litigation process. And this brings us to uh, our last slide, our next to last slide, I should say, our last slide on Section 9, Processing the Data. Here's the topic summary. First, we want to make sure we get a head start. Prepare for the processing while the questionnaires are still in the field. You don't have to just sit there on, on your chair uh, for a week or two weeks or whatever it is while the process of collecting the data is going on. You can be, pre you can be preparing the, the interviewers, uh, the uh, people who are not the interviewers, the, the folks who are going to be doing the, the quantitative analysis. Uh, you can expect a large volume of paperwork, very large. Surveys generate more material than many re researchers anticipate. You want to keep it neat and orderly, have a place for everything, and keep everything in its place. I didn't make that up. That, that's a quote. Maintain adequate records. Record things promptly and make notes rather than depending on recollection. Uh, uh, re recollection. Cite edit documents thoroughly. Establish criteria for acceptance or rejection of completed questionnaires and use them consistently. This means that the people who are doing the data analysis have to be as well trained and uh, an understanding of the uh, uh, process that you're going through uh, as the people who are doing the interviewing. Postcode questionnaires carefully. Every item that isn't pre-coded must be assigned a code value and recorded in the code book. Monitor data transfer. Be sure the data are keyed or recorded and filed promptly and accurately. Edit the computer data files. Check to be sure that records conform to the format and the variables, excuse me, and the variable values are within range. Third from the bottom, identify scale data types. Record the designations on a key questionnaire to use as a working guide. Next to last, reclassify data with care. Select categories that are more meaningful and recode continuous items with many values into fewer but larger categories for better understanding. And finally, enter names and labels. List variable names and category labels on the key questionnaire and enter, enter them into the analysis routines. So we've covered the three sections, seven, eight, and nine. Let's have on the very final slide, slide number 34, some examples. For section seven, Attorney and the subject matter expert are responsible working together, but the statistician should decide how to communicate with the target sample. The attorney and the SME statistician working together decide who will conduct one-on-one -on -one interviews and whether they should be face-to-face -face or by phone. And for number nine, I would uh, say let the SME statistician process the the data resulting from the surveys and or the interviews and present the results to the attorney or attorneys which he or she is working with. It can be re the data can be reanalyzed if the attorneys decide, well, we'd like to uh, focus more on, on one thing or another because the, as long as the raw data is still there, it can always be analyzed from a number of different positions. And for example, if you, if you hold up a... a a, a bottle of soda pop. Uh, if you look at it from one side, you get a you know one uh, one uh, idea. If you look at it from another side, you get a different idea. If you look at it from the bottom or the top, you get two more ideas. So there's a number of different ways of looking at the same data and coming up with uh, what may appear to be different results. I, I hate to use the old quote, but uh, the statistics don't lie, but statisticians can. So be careful who you select uh, to be your, your subject matter expert statistician, uh, both for the uh, initial discussions, for the creation of the questionnaire, uh, for the uh, deployment of the, of the questionnaires, uh, either through snail mail or, or email or by telephone uh, or by a face to face interview, and uh, conducting the analysis of the resulting data so as to provide your 
client with the best possible representation of the resulting data. Anything less than that, and you're not you're not you're doing uh, your your client a disservice. Matt, I believe that's that's what I've got for the uh, the folks today. Uh, are there any questions remaining that uh, you would like to pose to me? Uh, we have a couple questions here, and Jack, uh, before we get to the questions, I want to thank you for the time and the effort that you put into this presentation. I think there's a lot of uh, valuable information here and uh, some good takeaways for for the attendees. Um, Jack, how long, on average, should the uh, the data collection and processing take on you know for an average size survey? I hate, I hate to be nasty, but could you define for me average? I mean, for a, a, a survey that, that's going to be used in litigation, let's say for um, Are we talking uh, uh, oh, a oh, discrimination oh. case or a, a, a workplace matter. Okay, let, that's a good example. Let's suppose uh, that you're dealing with a, uh, a small company of, of, let's say, 50 people. That wouldn't take too long at all. Uh, let's say that the, the interview takes uh, half an hour or an hour. Uh, and that's, I'm just making that part up because it could be shorter or longer depending on uh, the questions that are being posed to the uh, respondents. Uh, and it depends on how many interviewers you have. You know, if you've got 50 people and one person is doing all the interviewing, it takes a lot longer than if you have five people or ten people doing the interviewing. But the more people you have doing the interviewing, uh, the greater potential for, uh, for uh, interview bias, for example. So that's a uh, something that, that the SME statistician and the attorneys uh, that he or she is working with would have to consider. Uh, once the data has been collected uh, and it's input uh, into the computer, there are all kinds of terrific software for doing an analysis, and it depends, you know, what you want to look at. Some some analyses may take a, a couple of minutes uh, to to do the to do the analysis. Getting it into the computer takes longer than doing the analysis. Then it takes time for the uh, SME statistician working with the attorneys to take the resulting uh, analyses that the computer has provided uh, and deciding whether or not that's what they're looking for or if they need to uh, look at that data from another perspective. And it might, it might be that you, you want to do a, a, a follow-on, you know, uh, what's called a longitudinal analysis. Maybe you want to know uh, how something uh, was six months ago, and then we want to know now uh, and be able to show a, a difference. I did a case on that just like that here in California uh, earlier this year, and a, a person uh, was, felt that they had been mistreated in terms of uh, they'd been let go even though they got an outstanding uh, evaluation the previous year. And we had to analyze the, the performance ratings uh, of everybody in, that, uh, in his section as well as the entire company, uh, to, to see what differences had, had taken place. I think I talked about that uh, in the uh, phase two presentation that we made uh, earlier. But how long does it take? You know, it's like like saying, how long does it take to drive from, from New York to Los Angeles? Well, it depends what road you take, depends on the weather, depends on the kind of vehicle, depends on whether you're adhering to the law, so many different factors need to be considered that, and I, I forgive me for begging off on this, but I, I can't really give you a, a good rule of thumb on how long it takes because it, it, all it takes is the attorney to say, well, what about this or what about that? And that's, that may change a lot of different things. And or the, uh, it may be that the uh, client that the attorney is representing wants certain questions asked that had not been put into the questionnaire. So you need to be talking to the client as well as uh, the attorneys and the and the SMEs. I, I hate to beg off on that, Matt, but that's a that's a one of those it depends kind of thing. Okay, great. Um, I don't see any other questions in the queue. So, uh, do you have any concluding remarks that you'd like to make? Yeah, uh, I, I know that so from talking to you, Matt, that the uh, there's a number of people that uh, have participated uh, in previous. Of, of these webinars on the subject of uh, statistics for attorneys in litigation, and I hope that uh, you folks that are that are listening today and watching and looking at the various uh, slides that we put up uh, are sufficiently incentivized uh, to come back 
two weeks from today and participate in the uh, fourth and final phase on, on, on this particular series. Uh, we'll be talking, as I mentioned earlier, about analyzing the results, interpreting the statistics, and reporting the information. Because you can have the greatest information, and if you report it in such a way that it's not believable or it's not understandable uh, to, the, uh, to the jury uh, or to the, uh, to the court, then you've got a problem. So we want to make sure that when you've done good work, that you're presenting it in the best possible way. And that's what we're going to talk about next time. Okay, thank you, Jack. Uh, again, a, a great presentation, and uh, thank you for the time and the effort that you put into it. And for those who joined us for today's program, thank you for taking an hour out of your day uh, to spend with us. If you'd like to speak to Dr. Jack Ravel about a case or project um, that you're currently working on or will be working on, you can contact us here at TASA. Our telephone number is 800-523-2319. As I mentioned during the introduction tomorrow morning, I'll send out a link to the archive recording of this program. Uh, included in that email will be a copy of the PowerPoint presentation used during today's program. The archive recording of this program, as well as all of our previous programs, can be found in our Knowledge Center. Uh, to get to our Knowledge Center, go to tassanet.com slash Knowledge Center, or click on the uh, Knowledge Center tab found at the top of the page, and you'll be able to find all of our previous programs. As Jack mentioned, our next uh, webinar for legal professionals, Survey Research Methods, Interpreting and Reporting Results, will take place on December 4th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Look for an invitation for me uh, in the not too distant future. And if you have any follow-up questions or comments, please feel free to email me at mhide.tassinet.com. We do take all of your comments um, under consideration, and they help us to produce better programs. So please don't hesitate to, to reach out to us and to, to give us honest feedback. Um, I wish everybody a happy and safe Thanksgiving, and we look Thank forward to at future TASA events. <laughs>